I'm going to focus very much on um, the current political landscape uh, and why I think that's not very good. Um, I must admit, if I was to use the words of Claire Perry, in your <laughs> was that a bill or a hiss from the back of the room? <laughs> um, she doesn't talk to me anymore. Um, it, it seems strange in, in an era where I thought political, political debate was encouraged that if you were to disagree with someone, they don't talk to you. But, but hey ho, um, let's work work around that. Although I must admit, it has been encouraging that in the last year there's been more discussion in Parliament about these issues than there has been in probably the previous five or six. Unfortunately, it has been in very much the wrong areas as far as I'm concerned. Um, so a little bit about me. I think Louisa said most of that anyway. Um, I hate the term digital natives, but it's still wheeled out quite a lot. Um, I'll give you a reason, an example of why I don't like the term digital natives. I have a class of 230 students. I give them a scene paper in the final year, and I put those um, questions up on a big screen in a lecture theatre. So this year, so this is me, a 40-year-old bloke, presenting to a bunch of 21, 22-year-old students. This year I put up the slides, the first question, they all started writing it down. How depressing is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped them after a couple of minutes. One was even down the front on their iPad typing it in, which I thought was... <laughs> I stopped them and went, Anyone not got a camera phone or a, a camera yeah. device on them? Oh, yeah. And then someone, oh, yeah, because it syncs automatically from the drop. So I don't like... I, I sometimes feel like I'm dragging them along with me rather than following what they do, but... I'm a, a big, passionate believer in technology and what it does with young people. Um, one of the examples I normally give of that is when I was teaching in Sri Lanka a couple of years ago, my kids saw so much about Sri Lanka when I was over there because of Skype. It's awesome. I mean, 10 years ago, when I was sort of doing my PhD, you'd get to the hotel, phone, all right, I'm here, I'll talk to you in a week, because it was so expensive. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? My kids are seeing where I am, what I'm doing. It's some fantastic thing. Uh, I've, I've spent the last three days in, in Liverpool talking to, to young people about a few, few issues, some quite sensitive, some less sensitive, but all, it's always an empowering, rewarding experience. Um, so, let any Daily Mail readers here today? <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask a different, let's, let's give you an example of the classic Daily Mail reader. My mother-in-law is a Daily Mail reader. Um, anyone here on Facebook? Um, she says you're disgusting. All right? <laughs> and the reason being, and I quote directly, everyone on Facebook talks about having sex and going to the toilet. <laughs> now, I might have sat on the can a couple of times updating a Facebook status, I must admit, but I don't think I've ever talked about doing it. <laughs> She also tells me that children shouldn't play with batteries because it gives them cancer. My boy shouldn't have long hair because it will make him short-sighted and TB is spread by immigrants. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going back to Cornwall later today. It's always a challenge. Um, so let's have a look at the sorts of things that, that we have to fight against. I must admit I do have to occasionally talk to a Daily Mail journalist. Um, it is always a challenge. Um, although I think probably Sky News are worse than the Daily Mail. When I, when I did the original work in sexting before I was into Sky News, they said, oh, can you say that children are going to die? No, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> are you sure? So I was like, oh, geez. Anyway, so th this was a piece um, last year where um, a, a Channel 4 reporter went and joined Havo Hotel, which is, used to be a fairly popular um, avatar-based social network for, for young teens and slightly younger children started wandering around the place going, hey everyone, I'm a 13-year-old girl. And interestingly, people started engaging in some sexually explicit dialogue with them. Must be the paedophiles. Now, this is a really difficult one, because yes, this stuff does go on. People are groomed online. We, I mean, I work with the police quite a lot, and some of the stuff they have to deal with is pretty grim. But, and now I met the reporter who did this work, and said, you know, a 13-year-old child might be some 13-year-old children might be likely to engage in sexual dialogue themselves, you know. She went, oh yeah, we knew that. But that's not what the Daily Mail wants to hear. Can you say it's the paedophiles? This one was fascinating last week. Now, John Carr, anyone know John Carr? Mm. Mm. Now, I've worked with John Carr in the past. He does love a headline, bless him. Google should do more to stop people seeing child abuse images. 
Google do sign up to the IWF um, watch list. I'm, I'm not aware of Google providing access to child abuse images. In fact, if you report it to Google, they will remove it from their index. If you report it to the IWF, they will add that site to their, um, their blacklist. So this was really confusing. What more are they going to do? I'm really confused by this one. I mean, I, I, was, I was pulled in. Well, well, one thing that was really concerning was I was phoned up by, by the local BBC radio station who I do quite a lot of work with down in the southwest. On the day this broke, said, can you come in and chat about it? And I sat down and I went, but the IWF maintained it. And they went, who's the IWF? <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I met a couple of BBC journalists in, in London whenever I was out here two days ago. And again, they went, who's the IWF? So we do have an established hotline where people can phone up if they see this sort of thing. But if no one knows about it, I mean, even if you go to somewhere like Chat Roulette, yeah, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> or Amigle. They're kind of like self-policing there, aren't they? I've seen someone enjoying themselves, I'm going to report them, they'll block that IP address. A community can be far more effective than an individual or an organisation trying to do this. Sort of. But I was just really confused by this because I'm not really sure that they are allowing you to access this. But let, let's get on to the main event then. Um, a third of ten-year-olds have seen explicit images. Children grow up addicted to online pornography. I was massively misquoted in the Metro. Another fine periodical. <laughs> um, say, saying that 11 year olds were addicted to pornography no, no I've definitely I've never ever met an 11 year old who's addicted to pornography maybe I'm just looking in the wrong places but um, <laughs> I <suppose> that <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent a day with primary age children in um, Liverpool um, on Wednesday they didn't really want to talk about pornography they wanted to talk about gaming and they want to tell me about all the games they played and the kit they used to do it and all those sorts of things. So, so I mean, I'm a little bit cynical about Claire, I must say. Here's someone with a background in defence who seems to be setting themselves up as the internet Mary Whitehouse, for those of you old enough in the room to remember Mary Whitehouse the first time round. <laughs> for those of you that aren't too lucky. But apparently, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, TV was doing to children what the internet is doing now, according to various people. Well, interestingly, these kids were telling me they thought the, the internet had been around for about 60 years. <laughs> and when I said that when I was growing up, there wasn't internet, one of them actually went, so what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do a, we do a, a constant piece of uh, ongoing survey work whenever we go and visit schools, or some of the people I work with visit schools, we always get the schools to do a, a little survey beforehand just to ask about what they do online and that sort of thing. Um, so... In terms of primary children, primary age children, around 2,000 of them responding. How do they go online? Well, the desktop PC is slowly dying out, sad to say. Although when you get a bit older and you become a gamer, the Alienware PC is the, the thing you really, really want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of my friend's 10-year-olds had just got an Alienware PC for his birthday. He's, he's like a god amongst his friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're seeing a rapid increase in, in mobile access, we're seeing rapid increase in tablet use as well and that sort of thing, and obviously gaming plays a part. And what do they do online? Gaming. No one is saying, because we're given other options as well, no one's saying searching for sexually explicit content, funnily enough. And actually, I do end up having conversations Obviously, you do not work, walk into a primary classroom and go, right, hands up, who looks at Paul? It doesn't go down well with the parents. But you can say, well, all right, what, what, is there, what stuff is there online that people are worried you might see? And very occasionally, someone will mention sexual content. But it's generally as a result of a pop-up, and they shut it down. Very, very occasionally, someone will say, an older sibling or an older friend and said, would you like to look at this? But most of them, and I talk to a lot of kids, Oh, they're not interested. <laughs> um, and they're kind of quite negative about it as well. So gaming is a big deal. And when you, you're comfortable if I use the, the new version of school years, if I say year seven, do you know what I mean by that? It's like first year secondary. When it moves into year seven, year eight, it flips. Gaming becomes less popular. Social networking becomes 
really quite popular. But interestingly, on Wednesday, most of the year five and six kids that I was spoken to were on Facebook already, and they all know you have to be on 13 to be on Facebook, so they all lie about their age, but none of them know why that you have to be 13 to be on Facebook either, which is interesting in itself. And I think that's reflected in the attitudes of my own children's school, um, which is a small rural school in Cornwall, where the, the deputy head teacher said, well, they shouldn't be on Facebook, therefore we don't need to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Um, what actually upsets them online? This is, this is provided for the children to do in class, um, but it's entirely anonymous, and it's uh, something where they can volunteer. The sorts of things that actually upset them. So... So swearing, that comes up an awful lot in my discussions where someone was mean to me, someone swore at me, so people being mean. A huge amount of this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. you know, that's, that sort of thing is really upsetting to them. Upsetting adverts. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to take a guess? Those what? Those chimneys won't take I explored this because we knew the school this came from. Who'd like to take a guess on why a project on the Victorians might upset someone of primary school age? Anybody over 40? No. Um, what's the name of Queen Victoria's husband? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doing that on an unfiltered Google image search might bring up some interesting responses. Um, and this one, you know. That's horrible. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? But, <coughs> interestingly, when I did the, the Claire Perry inquiry into, um, I think they called it children's online safety, um, it seemed to be making sure ISPs filter porn would be the, the more truthful aim of the inquiry, um, which I actually did because the Open Rights Group were, were asked to contribute, and I'm on the advisory council of the Open Rights Group, so Jim said, can you come along and do it. I was asked by one of the Tory peers, so if we filter pornography, we will solve all these online issues for children once and for all, will we? <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, so let's talk about something, I'll come back to that in a bit, but let's talk about something that, um, that I've been very much involved with is um, sexting. Are you all comfortable with what I mean by sexting? Taking a decent image, sending it via a mobile phone. I was introduced um, by someone a while ago as the national expert on sexting. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one, isn't it? Lighting, angles and lads, if you do it from below it looks bigger. No, no. <laughs> That's not the sort of thing I do, no. Um, this is something we've done quite a lot of work on, predominantly because we've gone into a lot of schools, and a lot of schools said we've had a sexting issue, we're not sure what to do about it. Um, then you go to policy makers who are uh, um, generally quite slow on the uptake, I think, in, in some of these areas because it moves forward so quickly. They go, well, where's the evidence for that? So we did do some, I mean, this was, this was something that came off the Daily Mail again, sex text epidemic. Now, any of you that have teenage children, can I just reassure you that I'm not seeing every teenage child in the country taking a picture of their genitals and sending it to other people. But they are aware that it happens, and I'll come back to that in a little while. We did some early research in 2010, 2011, which was survey work. Now, I'm not a massive fan of survey work, but it, it's useful for laying foundations. I don't think it's useful for exploring meaning or um, rationale or motivation. But we did some early, early work research, 2010, 11, around 1,000 14 to 16 year olds. You know, standard questions like, do you, do you or your friends share images? Um, have friends ever sexted? Now, what you don't do to a 14, 15-year-old um, young person is go, do you, do you do this? Because they go, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like the classic right hands up who wants to show me their internet history from the last week when you're talking to a bunch of 14, 15-year-old boys. Very few of them want to, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but around 40% were saying they knew someone who had done it. And that certainly was confirmed by the more recent work I've done, which is actually sat talking to people about this sort of thing. They all know people that it's happened to. Um, but I can think back to my school days. I introduced um, the kids I was talking to on Thursday to the concept of the Polaroid camera, because I hadn't. I can think back to that. Occasionally, a Polaroid picture would go around the year. Very occasionally. Very difficult to make 200 copies of a Polaroid photo. Very easy to send via BBM or WhatsApp or whatever. Many, many copies of the same thing. I'll come back to that in a little while. But it's something that, it is something they deal with. It is something they're aware of. But 
you know, one of the questions I get asked an awful lot is, oh, look, the internet's changing the way um, we think, what we think is acceptable, what we think is normal. And we did pose the question, what do you think is inappropriate? So you've got there, right at the end there, 15% of our respondents saying there's nothing inappropriate about someone naked, an image of someone naked. <coughs> so let's move on from there and pose the question, what is inappropriate then? So this is asking 14 to 16-year-old children what they think inappropriate is on an anonymous online survey. This is going to be fun, isn't it? Um, so a picture of my nan, 10 <laughs> Yeah, that always comes up. Um, I don't know what Gove is doing with the curriculum, but... <laughs> both grammatical and spelling errors in that statement there, I feel. Um, this is a more interesting one. <laughs> If you are sat there thinking, I wonder what these terms are, and I'm noticing there's a young member of the audience, like, please don't go home and Google this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help with the IT's web <laughs> Well, yes, absolutely. When Scunthorpe's blog, but Lemon Party isn't. <laughs> are you all aware of what a Lemon Party is? Don't, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> I did do this with my, a bunch of my own students uh, a while back in a room of about 200 students. Um, said don't do it. Someone with a laptop went... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the row behind went... Oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about Lemon Party is it's basically a bunch of elderly gentlemen enjoying each other's company. When you see the image you go, that's why it's called Lemon Party. It makes sense. <laughs> Everything's all wrinkled. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was introduced to the term, what was it? Two kids, one sandbox the other day as well. It's got nothing to do with children in sandboxes. I don't know why it's called that. <laughs> it's pretty grim. But anyway. <laughs> First of all, you look at that and you go, you dirty little bugger. <laughs> then you look at that and go, okay, well, this is a lad who's exposed to some pretty extreme pornography. Because this is all pretty grim stuff. And it does raise an issue about the sorts of things they are accessing now. Um, I'll come back to that, though. Now, with the 2012 work, we actually worked... It was inspired by a piece of work the NSPCC did that Jessica Ringrose of the Institute of Education did, which was very interesting um, in terms of what they found. But it wasn't really about technology at all. It was about attitudes towards um, school life, really. Um, but we did quite a lot of work with sitting in rooms with 14, well, year nine, so 13, 14 year olds talking about these sorts of things. Um, and the sorts of things that came up were, well, yeah, awareness is um, widespread, but practice isn't. Um, there is a level of, mm, yeah, it happens. I mean, one of the girls I was speaking to on Thursday about this went, it gets old really quickly. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because I think back to sort of my day again, the idea that you've seen someone's naked, semi-naked at that age, it was a really big deal when the very occasional Polaroid went round. Now, some of the lads were saying on Thursday in one of the schools, well, it probably happens about once a week. Well, okay. But they're also saying it's the same people. They're not saying, oh, if you extrapolate once a week, that's 52 a year. So if by the time you've reached sixth form, you've seen everyone naked in the school, it doesn't work like that. Um, there is a gender imbalance, and I'll come back to the gender imbalance in a while. Um, but boys are far more likely to ask, girls are far more, far more likely to be asked. Boys tell me, well, you know, you try your luck. <laughs> you'll, you'll ask, and then you'll keep on asking until someone does send a picture. Um, I didn't see a lot of what you might call classically predatory behaviour. Girls are far more likely to be asked. Um, Rather depressingly, I mean, because some girls are very, very straight about it, just because someone asks, you don't have to do it. And they're quite down on people that do do it. And I did say to one group who were very anti, I said, do you know what feminism is? No. What's that? That's quite, you know, <laughs> is feminism really such a dirty word that we can't use it in schools anymore? Because they were very empowered and very, very positive about their own gender, saying just because a boy asks you to do something doesn't mean you have to do it. But these are all social issues. What the hell has this got to do with technology? Apart from technology is facilitating the exchange. Boys might sometimes volunteer an image. One lad in one of the schools went, well, I've got a mate. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if he likes a girl, he'll send a picture of his bits. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and he went, I don't know really. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that happens at the start of relationships, not just during relationships as well. It's something that seems to be becoming part of the courtship ritual in some cases, and further distribution is certainly not unusual, which is a concern, certainly. Shame is transient. This is what some people have said to me. What happened to shame? What happened to embarrassment? Very clearly, from a lot of the, particularly the more recent stuff I've been doing, like the ones that, oh, it gets old really quickly. I just move on to someone else, someone else that happens to. But when we look at influence, can we really blame technology? Technology <coughs> has turned the teenage population into a bunch of deviants. Really? Has it? I'm sure when I was 13, 14, 15, if I had the sort of computing power I've got in my pocket now, I might be tempted to do that sort of thing as well. Hormones are raging, discovering sexuality. I mean, Dana Boyd said that teen, you know, teen sexting is a a very rational thing for a teenager to do, just with very irrational consequences these days, because the way of getting stuff out there is far more broad, more broad than it once was. There's certainly a lot of discussion about, at the moment about the sort of emergence of new era sexism. Has it become acceptable to be sexist these days? If you look at stuff like Spotted pages, Spotted at whatever university library, um, the Rate My Shag pages and all that sort of thing, um, you have got an interesting view, perspective there on, all right, is it all right to do this sort of thing now? Is the gender imbalance becoming bigger than it was? Is it acceptable? And then you look at the influences. The influences are far, far wider than internet technology. I think highlighted very clearly by this picture here. What's wrong with this picture? Where the hell's that hand come from? <laughs> Girls I talk to say they feel a massive amount of pressure about body image, not just from the fact that celebrities will do this sort of thing, but the fact that boys will post up on their Facebook pages, why aren't there any girls at school that look like this? So it's both direct and indirect pressure as a result of it. And they seem pretty clear about the whole idea about photoshopping and editing and that sort of thing, but equally it's still an image. I just love that. Where the hell's that going from? <laughs> um, if we are talking about this, er this area and celebrity influence, who am I thinking of next? You can't possibly avoid this topic without mentioning Talisa, who has been in the news again. <laughs> Bless her. Um, someone said to me a while ago, a 14-year-old girl, didn't do her career any harm, did it? Because three, weeks, three, four weeks after she was successful in her court case of um, taking the guy who leaked the, the video to court, um, she was on the Chris Moore show talking about a number one single. And someone this week said to me, well, famous people get away with it. So, well, it's very quick to point the finger at technology and go, oh, it's all technology's fault and technology is it's terrible. Well, it was home taping killing music back in my day and also video nasties. You remember video nasties? That was a term as well, wasn't it? I can remember watching American Werewolf in London when I was about 12. It scared the shit out of me, but I don't think it did anything too damaging to me. Um, I'm going to move on to something else now. And it's, a, no, it's something I'm doing quite a lot of work on at the moment, something where we're going to put out a report sort of in September on this. But I think it's a really interesting one because it's something where industry and technology is blamed a huge amount, but it's something where I think there's probably other areas you could look at. So what's this game here? Yeah, it's not great. Uh, Saints Row the Third. Saints Row the Third. <laughs> what? If any of you are unaware of Saints Row the Third, one of the best weapons of Saints Row the Third is... A massive purple dildo. Yeah. A six foot purple dildo called the Penetrator. <laughs> and you run around and you smack people around with it and you beat them up with it. And as you're running, it wobbles in your hand. It's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, Saints Row the Fourth coming out soon. I know some 12 year old kids are extremely excited about that. This was an issue. I didn't know about this game until I was talking to some year eights about it. They started talking about, oh, there's Saints Row the Third. <laughs> it's like, go on. You, you know. We always start these sessions by saying, look, you are not going to get in trouble for anything you say. This is a completely non-judgmental session we're doing there. And then they started talking about, say, for the third and how this one weapon was called the penetrator and you bail people around there with it. This one? 
GTA 4. Yeah. Um, well, the, why, the reason GTA 4 came up for me was um, when I was doing a session in uh, a primary school a while back. <coughs> this was something from a seven-year-old boy. Yeah, that does generally make people go, ooh. Um, now, you can't rape people in GTA 4. You can pay prostitutes for sex, yeah, and you can take drugs and like. Um, but I explored this with him a little bit more. I said to him, so, I don't think you walked into, because this was in Plymouth, I don't think you walked into Game in Town and bought this game, did you? No, no, my mum got it for me. Okay. And does your mum sit with you when you're playing it? No, no, I play it in my room on my own. Okay. How long do you play for? Oh, oh four or five hours sometimes. Okay. All right. Um, and you, again, Daily Mail headline. <sighs> Late night gaming. I mean, mobile phones are ruining children's lives because they're on, on them. What was the comment from one charity? 23 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um, excessive... Parents are saying to schools that their grades are suffering because of excessive web use. I can remember, are there any teachers here? I can remember, I don't know whether you can empathise with this, um, someone I work with quite a lot in one of the local Plymouth schools saying, um, they were told by a parent, you should be monitoring what our children are doing online 24-7. I just, where do you go with that? Um, because if we look at, the covers for both of these games, it can't be much more explicit. Now, I'm not a massive fan of these strict certifications on games. I've met many, many younger children, 11, 12, 13, playing things like Call of Duty. They were very well adjusted. They know it's not real. Interestingly, when I say, have you ever seen anything in Black Ops 2 that's upset you, most of them will go, oh, when, when Woods died, if any of you played Black Ops 2, one of the main characters gets killed halfway through. So, but you've been running around shooting people in the face for the last... We. <laughs> yeah, but you get attached to the characters, don't you? So the narrative was the thing. That they, you know, they, they can differentiate between reality. And, and I think there, there has to be a judgment made by the parents. But I don't think in a lot of cases the parents are making those judgments. Because industry are being told, industry aren't doing enough. Gaming is ruining children's lives. Um, I was... The Office of Children's Commission has been doing quite a lot of stuff recently. I did something a while ago with them where I, where I highlighted this, and someone told me at the end of the session, but industry shouldn't be making violent video games anyway. Why not? Well, oh, because it encourages the start to be violent. Show me the evidence. I mean, what, is Black Ops 2 just an extension of Space Invaders? I mean, I have the Atari console. I've been playing games for that long. When my lad got um, Mario Kart on his 3DS, he was showing it. like, boy... I was playing this 20 years ago. It's like, <laughs> you're not going to show me anything new with this game. I think I'm pretty well adjusted. Now, the problem with this whole space is we just lump children into one big lump. Oh, right, like children. Children do this, children do that. I have spoken to Ed Sykes that say that some, particularly on the more immersive environments, it does sometimes change their behaviours and they sometimes demonstrate addictive tendencies. But generally, you explore that further and it's not just you have someone without any other issues and then they start gaming and gaming ruins it. It's, you know, other things that happen as well. The seven-year-old lad with the rape comment, massive parental issues there, massive child protection issues going on there as well, non-attentive parents, one of the parents is alcoholic and things as well. You, you have all these other issues as well. Um, which is why I was quite surprised from the Office of the Children's Commission. This report that came out a couple of weeks ago um, was really interesting. Education. What a mad idea. Rather than banning and blocking, because, I mean, I've had some very hilarious conversations with 13, 14-year-old boys about pornography. Absolutely hilarious. But I was in one school a while ago, and they were talking about the Claire Perry stuff, very maturely, and this one lad just went, that won't stop us looking at porn. Very, you yeah. know. Because, you know, when they shut down Napster, it stopped them all file sharing, and everyone went back to HMV and started buying CDs again. <laughs> what? I know with my own lad, I went past HMV in Plymouth a while ago, when he's nine, he's very into heavy metal. What's that? It's a record shop, mate. What's a record shop? Where people buy music. Buy music. <laughs> <laughs> because he plays something on, on Guitar Hero, or he sees something on YouTube, he's going to have that on my iPod. And, you know, within a few minutes, it's on his iPod. Whether that's for illegal or illegal means is not for this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but what's 
once I found, like I said, I leave these sessions, and it was interesting, the very last session I did in Liverpool on Thursday before I came down to London was with a bunch of Year 9 lads, and we were talking about some pretty extreme things, and they were being very open and honest about it, and they said at the end of it, are you coming back? And I said, what do you mean am I coming back? This has been really good fun. <laughs> I said, oh, don't you get a chance to do anything like this? No. Sex ed is delivered in science. Okay. I like putting drugs awareness in chemistry or something. That's, that's how you make it. Therefore, that's what I don't I just think all, if, yeah, okay. if you look at um, the recent review of PSHE, social ed, for the older members of the audience, um, it really didn't acknowledge much about internet technology. So if you look at sex and relationship education, very little about internet as well. If you look at the proposed changes to the ICT or computing curriculum, they're talking about removing the stuff around. Well, I, I don't like to use the term online say to be removing stuff around digital behaviours as well, because that's just a primary issue now. Um, those that I do speak to who say they do cover this sort of thing in school, it's normally, well, we're shown the CEOP video and assembly and told to think on. <laughs> um, equally, I was, I mean, because peer ed programmes seem to be quite successful in this area, and I talked to a lot of older kids in secondary school, so yeah, it would be great to go and talk to some of the year sevens, year eights, because when you're talking to a someone who's 15 going, well, it's kind of too late for us, but we really ought to tell them at year seven, year eight, that they probably shouldn't be taking pictures of their bits and sending. It's a really interesting, but they will learn a lot from the peer ed programs as well. But interestingly, at one school I was at a while ago, they're talking about a peer ed program, and the, the head of PSHE there said that three of the six tutors in the, the year they were talking about would not talk about this sort of thing. They would refuse point blank to talk about this sort of thing. Which is a shame, because I think, you know, Again, back in my day, the phone would go, I found me dad's magazines. Hey, that's what we're in there. Um, it, it's accessible, it's there. Having the, the ISPs block it, well, it'll either go to different file sharing mechanisms or everyone will start using HTTPS rather than HTTP. Or it's, my dad's removed the porn filter. That's what we're in there then. It seems really strange to say, well, ISPs are going to do And my biggest concern about that is it's another excuse for parents to go, someone else is doing something about this. Um, because, you know, Google says so. You can switch it on in the home if you want to. There are parental controls available in the home. You don't have to rely on other people to do all this sort of thing the whole time. So in summary, then, um, it's a complex area. And it's not just about technology. It's about society and the responsibilities of society. And while I don't like the term stakeholders, I think in this case all stakeholders do need to take, play their part. Because it's not just some of us, like within the sector, within the field, saying we need to do more education around this. I'm talking to children all the time saying, why can't we do more of this in, in schools? Why can't we talk about this in schools? But not just in assembly. <coughs> and finally, this last question, what could the LRG do about it? Well, while I wouldn't like to put more on Jim's plate, because he's busy enough anyway, I do think there's a real opportunity here because, you know, I talk to sort of year 10, year 11s, they all, they're all passionate about digital rights, they're all aware of people like Anonymous, they're all aware of what the government's talking to. And I think you could potentially have a, the potential for a grassroots youth panel that would actually be a proper voice. Because if you look at some of the youth panels that are out there, they are not hugely representative of the sorts of people I talk to. Let's, let's leave it at that, shall we? But, but yeah, so good to meet you all. Um, I'm around for about another 25 minutes, so I guess we'll have <laughs> questions now. But, but otherwise, by all means, track me down online, just not on Twitter, because I'm off there for the minute. But by email, I'll, I'm on all the time. Thanks.